also invertible, so you see that also R contains I to the N divided by I to the N. And therefore, well it is easy to see that if you look at this sequence, then it is non-decreasing, it is so, yeah, so you can keep going here. And it follows, therefore, that R is an overring of the union of this increasing sequence of rings. And I start here from zero, even though I did not define i to the power zero, but i to the power zero, since I just required i to be a z module, I will define i to the power zero just to be z. Now let me tell you something about all these rings here, and in fact, if you have an x in H that is not zero, then maybe I call it Y, then you see that all these X's with this property have to satisfy X times Y is in H, so that you, then you see that H divided by H is sitting in Y inverse H. So if my H is finitely degenerated, like all these powers of I as an abelian group, then this is an order. And here we have an increasing sequence of orders. And they are all sitting in the maximal order. But the maximal order as an additive group is Noetherian. You don't have infinite strictly increasing sequences of subgroups, let alone subrings. So that means that this union converges. And the very pleasing theorem is that this union is actually the blow up of I. Which actually may answer your question from Hartshorn because there he defines the blow up as a certain proj, and if you take the global sections of the proj, then you get also a union of this shape. Okay, so. That is not entirely trivial. Let me see whether I can say a little bit about the proof. The proof, of course, is in the notes. It is by no means an easy proof, but it becomes significantly easier if you assume a theorem from Dade and Towski and Tassenhaus from 1962 and this theorem is as follows uh, so I take R an order in K well let's let's do it uh, in, let's assume that R is an order of full rank for convenience. You make, K, you make K a little smaller maybe. So Q of R is the field of fractions. And you take J a fractional R ideal. Then the statement is that if you take j to the power n minus 1, oh, what, no, let's call it m minus 1, let's call it d minus 1. d means degree. So d is the degree of k over q, which is the rank of r as an abelian group. Then this r ideal is invertible well, not over R in general, but over its own multiplier ring. That is a theorem that does take some work, and that work is 
has been done in the paper by Dade, Towski and Sassenhaus and it has also been done in the notes that were written by Dan van Gent. If you want to apply this theorem here then you have to uh, replace I by a J that is uh, ideal over the appropriate ring. But let me formulate the theorem to which all this gives rise. So that is theorem 7. So I take I and K as before and then the statement is that there is some integer then there is an integer M, non-negative, and it has an upper bound. It has an upper bound which is no more than the degree of the field that we are looking at. So this X is, as before, a non-zero element of I. And if you take its degree minus 1, which is at most the degree of K over Q minus 1, there is an integer M with the following property such that for all non-negative integers n one has the following what you like to know is when the limit has been reached and that is a little bit treacherous because it may happen that two consecutive members of this sequence are equal without it being equal to the next one. So if it looks as if it stabilizes, then the limit may not yet have been reached. There is very easy to give examples of this. Maybe I will say a little bit more about it in a few minutes. But here we get a precise description of where you have to stop. So the question is, is this blow up equal to the nth term in my sequence? And the first n for which this happens is this number m. And you can test this by checking whether i to the n is invertible over its own multiplier ring. And that is something, if that happens, then you don't have to check the n plus first member anymore. That is the moment that you know that you can stop. So here x again is in i without being zero. And this theorem, well, it's not easy, but it really follows with not too much effort from this result from 1962. So what I would like to close this lecture with is by giving some type of enlightening example. Any questions? Yes? So, Dan, luister, uh, jongen. Given the date Hartley Dobbin House theorem, when we're building the blow up, does it just suffice to define the blow up as i to the d minus 1 for i to the d minus 1? Yeah, you can do that. But then, of course, uh, you still have to prove, uh, <laughs> you still have to come up with your R. You see, in my theorem, there is no R yet. I'm just giving an I. Okay, thank you. What you can do is define this to be R, well, the blow up, and then take J equal to R times I. That is the way you can apply the Dade theorem. 
okay, so let me then write down some examples. And those examples are examples of eyes of small rank and the rank of i that is the unique number n for which i is isomorphic to z to the n and i is non-zero so this n is not zero either so we have first a the case of rank one in which case i is equal to z alpha where alpha is a non-zero element of k star but that is not a too interesting case because in the part of theorem 6 that I have been stupid enough to erase I showed, I, I, I mentioned that the blow up doesn't change if you multiply by i, so you see that the blow up of i is the blow up of z and the blow up of any subring of k, of any order I should say, is equal to the ring itself. So that is an uninteresting case. What is a more interesting case is when you have two generators and I really want the rank to be two so my alpha and beta they should be non-zero elements of K, not just non-zero but also linearly independent over the rationals and then just as before you may as well look at z times one plus z times gamma where gamma is alpha over beta simply divide by beta but of course you can also do the other way around so in everything that I am going to write down next you have have to keep in mind that there should be a certain symmetry between gamma and gamma inverse. And the way in which in this case you can compute and describe the blow up can be expressed in several ways and one is by uh, writing down this the irreducible polynomial of gamma so let f that is a n times x to the n so n is the degree of gamma which is at least two because gamma is irrational the rank is two so I look at this polynomial that is the irreducible polynomial of gamma over, well, over z. So I want this to be irreducible in the ring zx. And I want that gamma is zero of f and irreducible means in particular that it will not be divisible by a prime number so the content of this polynomial f the gcd of the coefficients should be one and it is very easy to see that such an f is up to sign uniquely determined by gamma and we can also pass to a homogeneous polynomial, so that is f, that will be y to the n times f of x over y, so that is homogeneous of degree n. 
and it is clearly a polynomial satisfied by alpha comma beta. Now with all this notation I can tell you in several ways what this blow up is equal to. In terms of algebraic geometry, if you look at the spectrum of this blow up, then it is the same as what people would call the proj. So that will be a closed subscheme of the projective line cut out by F. And that is uh, an irreducible one-dimensional subscheme of this projective line and by the content equal one it is not vertical it has to be horizontal and that is what it is and what it is explicitly well you look at i to the n minus one so let me change my i into the new one i to the n minus one that is simply the direct sum from i is zero to n minus one of z times gamma to the minus one so that is has a z basis consisting of the first n powers of gamma with exponents ranging from 0 to n minus 1. And then you see from this that the blow up must multiply this thing into itself. In particular it has to multiply the 1 into this n minus 1 and therefore it has to be contained in the ring generated by gamma. However, that need not be this direct sum because gamma need not be an algebraic integer. That is something to be very careful about. But to make it into, and this may not be an order if gamma is not an algebraic integer, to make it into an order you have to do the same thing with the roles of alpha and beta interchange so that you have to read your polynomial f backwards and you have to take this intersection of z gamma and z gamma inverse and that is actually an order and in terms of the gamma and the ai you can write down a perfectly explicit basis of this ring over z and maybe i will actually do so even though you can also check it in the notes because this example i expect to come back in my lecture on thursday and what i would hope because this example amounts to an algorithm in the rank 2 case and the rank 2 case is in a sense critical because I mentioned that if every ideal generated by two elements is invertible then every fractional ideal is invertible but what I do not know is how you can reduce the case of general I to the case of just two generators and yeah what I forgot to mention of course is that this theorem implies that the blow up can be computed in polynomial time because it is quite straightforward to check that this i to the n divided by i to the n for example for n equal to this value can be computed in polynomial time okay so i think that i spent my five extra minutes and i thank you for your attention <laughs> but maybe there are still questions yeah, is there a quick question yes thank you great Happy you that you are actually paying attention. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I guess we'll we'll end here. So yeah. So you have a problem session. So grad students have a problem session. We have a research uh, program has talks in here. Um, oh, one one small thing for if if you. Pay